everyone. So welcome back to another episode of To Your Health with Dr. G. Thank you for joining me today. Oh my gosh, as I do it every week, tonight's show is so important. I'm so glad that I'm here today. Welcome back to another episode. My name is Dr. Mark Gomez. I'm a board certified internal medicine physician practicing at Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and we are bringing you today covid and kids. I get another episode of Tear Off with Dr. G. And this episode is so personal to me. Those of you that have been following me on social media this week, I've been really trying to pump this up because the reality is this, we have to set the record straight. Our children are our future. And I know that sounds kind of cliche and that was a song I think, but the reality is that our children are so much central to how we're gonna have success and get past this pandemic. So it's important that we talk about it because the reality is also this, we're not spending enough time talking about the impact on children that this virus has had as we are talking about it in adults. Again, nobody's been, been basically immune to the effects of COVID-19. We're dealing with COVID-19 physically, we're dealing with it emotionally, we're dealing with mentally, we're dealing with it spiritually. In every way possible, every single human being has been affected, and we will continue to be affected by the implications of COVID-19 for the foreseeable future. We have to talk about this and set the record straight for our children out there. As a father, I have two small children at home. This means everything to me. As any parent would do, you want the best for your kids. You don't want them to be at risk for anything. And so this is personal having this conversation. It's easy for me to have this conversation when I talk with my patients, my adult patients. I can talk COVID very easily with them. It's another conversation to break it down to our children, especially based on their age and their knowledge. Um, but, it's, but it's hard to do so, but it's not impossible. We have to continue to have open and honest conversations with all of us because we're all in this together. How we succeed in this COVID pandemic is going to be a defining moment. There's been so much of a firepower, an explosion of research and unity and opportunity and creativity and ingenuity and innovation when it comes to how we're dealing with this pandemic. We have to keep this going on. Remember this. We're still mired at this crisis. We're going to be in it for the foreseeable future. But we can learn how to continue to accommodate and support one another in this process, and especially as it relates to our kids. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez. You're going to meet my amazing guests in a few moments. Remember, check me out on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. Check me out on all my social media handles, at To Your Health DRG. Again, we're all about building trust and delivering truth. Now, before we get in, you meet my amazing guests, because we're going to get right into it. i got to hit you with a quick disclaimer. Here we go. The content of To Your Health with Dr. G is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and that the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. Further details can be found at www.drmarkgomez.com. All right, so let's get at it, guys. So here we go right now. I want to introduce you to my amazing panel. We have on but just, just, it just it just tickles me. It's great. So we have my amazing panelists. I want to get right to it. They've been a guest on my show in the past, and we're going to talk about it in this detail. So my first guest, she and I went to Loyola together. I spilled the beans. Sorry about that, Dr. Johnson. Okay. I was going to say, where'd you go to medical school? Uh, but but she's my longtime friend and former classmate at Loyola Street School of Medicine. I want to introduce you guys to my great, my dear friend, Dr. Kate Johnson. Kate Johnson, MD, associate, assistant professor board-certified adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist, Loyola University Medical Center. Hey, Dr. Johnson, hey. welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm very excited to be back again. Dr. Johnson, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you do? I already leaked, the, I already leaked it on your training. You, uh, yeah, medical you did. School, but Tell us medical <laughs> school, residency, and, um, and what this topic means to you. Uh, absolutely. So like you said, we started together at Stritch School of Medicine, Loyola, over there in Maywood. Um, I ended up in North Carolina, University of North Carolina, for both my general psychiatry residency and my child and adolescent psych fellowship. Um, stayed around in North Carolina for a little while and then came back home to Loyola. We can't, we can't ever get too far away. So um, it's been an interesting time for all of us in uh, the past few months. It's, you know, our department has just really had to adapt and change and you know, for a while there, um, every, you know, I was, so I'm actually, I've actually been in charge of like coordinating our response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic for our department. And, 
you know, for every 10 minutes, there was some new directive and I was sending out emails to the whole department twice a day. And, you know, we've, we finally kind of hit a stride now, but it's been interesting to see the way this all kind of um, progressed, you know, that people have been through a lot of different reactions and a lot of different things and seeing both kids and adults, like it's, it's an amazing time and a terrifying time. And, but like you said, we're all going to get through it together. Excellent. So again, Dr. Kate Johnson, just love it that you're here. We're going to get more granular in a few moments. Again, you guys are joining us here live on To Your Health with Dr. G. We're talking COVID and kids. I want to introduce my next guest, Dr. Steve Kovar. I want to read his credentials. Dr. Stephen Kovar, MD. He's a board certified pediatrician with Kids First Pediatrics LTD. He's chair of Department of Pediatrics at Edward Hospital. Dr. Kovar, welcome back to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Please tell us a little bit about yourself, where did you do your medical school, where did you do your residency, and certainly a few opening remarks on today's topic. All right. Uh, I did my medical school at University of Illinois in Chicago, and then staying kind of in the Chicago area, I went to Advocate, it's now Advocate, but it's Hope Children's Hospital on the uh, south side in, uh, uh, where is it? Gosh, it's been so long. <laughs> it's uh, on the south side in Oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot where it's at. But Hope Children's Hospital, super awesome place. Um, it's going to be one of those, like, I'm just going to pop in and say, oh my gosh, it was here. Um, and then after that, I joined a practice out in Naperville, and I've been out this way ever since. And so right now we're in Plainfield, Illinois. And, um, you know, again, with COVID, just like um, just like Dr. Johnson was saying, it is taken everything that we known, and it's just pulled it, the rug out from under us because everything is changing so quickly. And... Uh, you know, one thing, you, you learn one thing, and then 15 minutes later, you're getting a memo that's, oh, hey, actually, this whole thing has changed. And so for pediatrics, it's difficult because people come to us looking for answers and looking for guidance. And like everyone else, our guidance is, is it's changing. And it's so difficult for us to give that when it's changing so much for us, too. And then also for our practice, um, the bigger issue of coming in, and we'll probably get into this later, is just the fear. And when fear comes out about anything, um, it, it makes people not want, you know, they either they seek us or they avoid everything. And because everything has been told to avoid, 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 you know, we've seen people not coming in for well checks and all that stuff. So then children's health can uh, take a hit, which is obviously a major concern and, you know, major concern not only for the pandemic, but just also for the general health of the child and also for the nation. Well, thank you, Dr. Kovar, Dr. Johnson. Uh, this is awesome. We're going to have just some more continued great discussion. Again, those of you guys that are just joining us, we're talking live here on TRF with Dr. G and talking serious topic, COVID and kids. You know, for you parents that are out there, grandparents that are out there, caregivers that are out there, I want you guys to go ahead and take some notes. You know, what we're having today is we're having honest conversation about what are the implications, both short and long term, for our children. What can we do? to uh, really assess and protect their risk, to lower their risk? And what kind of outlook are we looking at? What kind of outcomes? What kind of precautions should we take? And what expectations do we have for our children, not only as us caregivers and parents and grandparents, but what is the role that, that they have, have a role to play too? So we're gonna talk about those questions and more. So let's get right into it. So uh, Dr. Johnson, <laughs> the stats, said, and the stat, these are the latest stats out of CDC. Um, and it's kind of, I always like to lay, the, lay it out there, but uh, a lot of, one of the biggest misnomers out there is that kids are, are immune to getting COVID-19. The latest statistics out of the CDC uh, published earlier this week was about roughly 85,000 children have been confirmed positive of COVID-19. That number may be actually be an underestimate because still in the beginning, uh, when we tried to roll out testing cap capabilities, we could not really meet the demand uh, as the virus is spreading rapidly throughout our country. But when you think about that statistic, 85,000 kids, you know, what does that really mean to you? I mean, how do you interpret that? Do you, you know, just talk about the impact of the lives that are out there. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of kids. And I agree with you. I think that um, statistic is likely underreported. I think the, you know, kids are probably less likely to present for testing because it does seem um, that they are more likely to be asymptomatic than adults. Um, and to be fair, as far as we know, about 50% of adults are going to be asymptomatic too. So kids are, you know, less likely to get hard hit. They're you know, more likely to just be asymptomatic. They're less likely to get tested because of it if they're not exhibiting any sort of symptoms or there's any prompt for testing. So, and like you said, when the, when the virus was in its, you know, biggest sort of phase of spread, 
we didn't have the testing capability that we needed to really track it. So I agree with you. I think there's probably, you know, that's probably a gross underrepresentation. And, you know, again, the implications for kids, there are some, um, definitely some kids who've gotten sick, some kids who've, who've died from this. Um, there's, there was some interesting stuff coming up about, um, you know, Kawasaki's disease and things like that that might be caused by COVID. Um, but the vast majority of kids seem to be, like I said, asymptomatic, which means, the, you know, if we let them kind of go about and be kids, they're going to be bringing the, the virus home to their grandparents, to their parents, to their siblings, to people who are potentially more vulnerable. Um, and kids are great at spreading illnesses. If they've ever had a kid in daycare, if you've ever actually met a kid, right? Like they are great at, at being tiny little vectors. Um, so unfortunately, you know, we, we can't just let them kind of go about their day and do their thing while all the adults are wearing masks and doing whatever. And that's certainly going to have a different impact on them than it is on us. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. You know, Dr. Kovar, you hear that statistic. Right. What does that mean to you? You know, it's, it's, I think just like, um, just like Dr. Johnson was saying, I think it's underrepresented, upper, underrepresentative of what actually was there because part of the issue was COVID. It, like a lot of things, the adults are the ones that are going to get the news. Obviously, kids, when kids get sick, it, there's, there's news to it. But when it's the number of adults that were happening, uh, we're getting infected with it and we're uh, dying because of it, that's going to take the news. And so there weren't as many kids, they weren't showing the signs. And there are a lot of problems because kids don't show the signs. And a lot of stuff could just be the normal stuff that kids have. So when the adults are, take, you know, are, having, more, are having more symptoms and more cases, that's going to take it away from the kids. And so the problem is that also, you know, the number of kids that are actually infected by it, um, I was just looking up, it's, I think it's, it ends up being about like 1.7% of all the cases are in kids. Um, babies are going to have the highest mortality and kids under the age of one. But then when you start looking, um, it was, it was uh, the number of severe cases, it's 11% of kids under the age of one. But then when you get from one to five, about 7% will have it. And then from ages six through 15, 4% are going to be severe. And then over 16, it's 3%. So it's small, small numbers of a small subset. And for what we know, it, it doesn't have that, that push. And then also we had such, uh, so few tests. It was, do we test the 80 year old who has been in a nursing home or do we test this otherwise healthy 10 year old? And so that's where the problem comes in. And, uh, you know, unfortunately kids, you know, kids, well, I guess, fortunately, kids can, are resilient, and they can fight a lot of these things. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes kids can't. And so, you know, we just have to make sure that we remember that kids are part of this whole situation, too. So mm -hmm. let me ask you this question, Dr. Johnson, how does one, you know, there's a parent out there <laughs> listening to us, or a grandparent out there listening to us, how do you have a conversation with your child about the current situation that we're in. How does one start that? How would you advise a parent that comes in of a, of a child? How can I talk to yeah. my kid more about this? That's a, that's a difficult conversation to have, right? Um, I think you have to be mindful of, of, you know, where your kids are developmentally, right? Like you're gonna have a different conversation with a three-year-old than you're gonna have with a 13-year-old than you're gonna have with your 18-year-old. Um, but I think you start by saying like, what do you think about this, right? Find out what they know, see how they're feeling. Some kids are going to be like, this is stupid. I don't know why I can't hug, hug grandma. And others are going to be like, this is terrifying. I don't want to leave the house ever again, right? Um, and so I think you start, you know, you kind of start with them at, and, and you just, you know, you meet them where they are. Um, but I, I always advocate being honest with our kids to a, to a level that's appropriate. Um, and, you know, what I've been talking with a lot of my parents about is um, this is a great opportunity to kind of build, like, compassion and empathy in your kids and say, like, okay, you know what, I don't like going out without a mask or, you know, with a mask on either. I don't like that I can't get, you know, close to people. I really miss hugging my friends and seeing my friends. I really hate that I can't go to a restaurant anymore. Um, but it's really important that we do these things because science has shown us that this is what's going to make a difference. And so now it's our job to take care of other people. And you know what, even if you don't feel sick, 
you still have a job to do and we are going to do this and we are going to take care of our friends and our family and our neighbors. And we're going to be good citizens of our community, right? Like I think you, you can definitely, you know, kind of cultivate that, um, that sort of social responsibility and that, that compassion in your kids during all of this. Well, you know, and then, oh, go ahead. I, oh, I was going to say, and then I think you just listen to whatever emotions they kind of give you and, and I think you have to be upfront with them about, you know, things are changing and, and this is sometimes really scary, but we're going to do the best we can and we can, you know, get through it together. So they know that you're with them and they have that sense of safety. I think you hit the head on there. You have to explain it to them and be honest about that. I know, again, it's not a comfortable conversation to have. And, and uh, But I will say this, and I'm sure you would agree, uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Kovar, that uh, us as Oh, as adults, as caregivers, parents, grandparents, coaches, whatever, you know, children are extremely perceptive. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have our stuff together, our anxieties and our stressors under control, the children will see that same thing and they will emulate that behavior. So Absolutely. one of the things that I talked about to my parent, to, to my patients, I see adults, is I say, you can set the tone and be honest, but try to keep composed. So like, for example, don't have the TV tune on to COVID updates all the time. Don't have, you know, uh, you know, don't be checking your phone for COVID updates, but there's ways to do that. Dr. Kovar, I want you to take it a little bit further, you know, you know, talk about a little bit of the difference between, you know, having a conversation with a five-year-old and then a 15-year-old, but then you're the adult parent that <laughs> has to try to make some sense out of it on the seriousness right. of what we're dealing with. Well, sometimes five-year-olds and 15-year-olds are kind of the same too. So that, that makes things a little easy and difficult at the same time. But in all honesty, it's, it's just like Dr. Johnson said, you have to kind of figure out what, what do they know? What are they scared about? Listen to them. That's the thing that, you know, I tell parents all the time. The most important thing you can do is listen to your kids because they're, they're going to give you the answers. They're going to tell you how they're feeling and because kids aren't great at hiding things, uh, you know, and emotions and stuff. And you can tell when, when they're upset and when they're nervous, you have to be able to pick up on some of those things. And, and ask those questions and, you know, get a feel for what they're concerned about, but talk to them in, 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 in age appropriate. So you're not going to talk to a five-year-old about, you know, how vectors are transmitted and, you know, here's the difference. You just have to say that, you know, we have to do these things and this is why we have to do this. But also the biggest thing is being an example yourself. You can't say, you know, oh, don't touch your face as you're kind of, you know, blowing into your hand and, you know, you know, you know, you need to wear a mat. It's like, it's like, it's like eating broccoli. You can't say you have to eat your broccoli, but if someone gives you broccoli, like, oh, don't give it to me. So you, we have to be good examples to them. And that's for 15, that's for, you know, one-year-olds to a hundred year olds. We always have to be good examples. Um, so 15 year olds, because again, so much of their life involves the social aspect of being a kid. Um, it's making sure that they understand why we're doing these things. We're not punishing them that you can't go see your friend. Yes, you can you know, talk to them on Zoom or whatever the newest app is. Um, it's obviously, it's not the same, but it's keeping explaining to them why it's not, you know, and it's, and it's not so much for you because as a 15 year old, you know, again, your number of, your chance of having something bad is low, but we have to think about, you know, if you can relate it, you have to think about me, you have to think about grandma. These are the things that you might not feel something, but you know, if you give it to me and then I have to go to work and I work in a nursing home, or I work, you know, something, I might give it to someone and we, you know, again, we're a global community and it definitely, I think this has really kind of proven that, that we are so intertwined. Um, so for the older kids, it's, it's, it's also just keep going again about social responsibility and, and all that kind of stuff so that they know that they're doing this for the greater good. You know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, you want to be like, you know, uh, you know, in 19, in the 1940s, we were sending our kids to war. We're asking you to sit on a couch and watch Netflix. You know, it's, a, you know, you want to be like that, but you can't, you also can't just dismiss and be like, you know, you just need to kind of shut up and do what you're supposed to do. Because at that point, now you're going to start getting some of the resentment. You're also going to get some rebellion because kids are going to be like, oh, well, I'm just going to go out for a walk. And then, you know, you happen to follow them. And meanwhile, they're hanging out with their friends. I've seen that. I've, I took my kids on a bike ride. It was just the three of us. And I looked and I said, I looked at these kids. I said, I know you're not a family. Like, and it's tough because they're tired. And but just because you're tired of something doesn't mean it stops existing. And so we have to continue that fight. And I think that's an important thing for kids to know just because you're tired of it. There's still there's still work to be done. And that's an important thing. Dr. Johnson, from a mental health standpoint, is there a particular diagnosis or diagnoses that you're seeing in children during this time? You know, we've all been cooped up inside. Yeah. Uh, but, but what are some of the common mental health implications that you're finding in your clinical practice or when you talk to, you know, other, some of your colleagues 
What are we seeing in the community as it relates to kids and mental health during this COVID-19 crisis? Well, sadly, I don't have a DSM code for cabin fever um, because that would definitely be the one I'd be uh, diagnosing the most. But, you know, I've definitely seen, certainly in terms of symptoms, I've seen a certain, a, a great uptick in anxiety um, far and away. Like, you know, when I talk to my younger patients or my, my teenagers in particular, it's like, I, I, don't, I don't know what to think about this. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going to happen. What about my family? What about the world? What am I going to be able to see anybody again? What about school? What the heck happened with school, right? And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kind of anxiety and nowhere to put it. So that's just kind of bubbling up. I've certainly seen an increase in depression as things have gone on, um, irritability, you know, I think that um, for better, or for worse, a lot of family time is a lot of family time, right? And, you know, I think we're, we're seeing a little bit more of um, that kind of oppositional behavior in some kids and, you know, just kind of being defiant and, and wanting to, you know, feel like they're in control of something, but kids aren't always great at communicating that. And so they just act out. Um, and I definitely, my poor ADHD kids, you know, especially with the e-learning, um, they either seem to love it or hate it, right? Because they could either like do all their work in an hour and be done and go like spend the rest of the day doing whatever they want. Or they were just like, I can't focus. This is terrible. You know, like they're not moving as much. They're not, you know, like getting, getting their wiggles out. As I say to the younger ones, um, the, the e-learning is completely unstructured. Like their days at home are unstructured. So I've definitely seen uh, some issues with that as well. And I was going to, and just to, 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 to kind of go on there, I think the other thing that we're seeing is the sense of loss for some oh, of these kids. Sure. So as, as they have these, as, as uh, the parent of a senior in high school, you mm. know, there's, there's, you know, everything's built up, you know, for your four years, you're watching as the seniors before you get to like laugh at you, like, Hey, enjoy your extra week of school or, Hey, we're going to prom. We're going to this. And, you know, it kind of builds up and prom is this thing and graduation is this thing, the pomp, the circumstance, you're the focus at for one point. And all of a sudden it was just ripped away. And, and it's difficult, it's difficult to tell them, you know, and, and, and it's, it's somewhat sad, but like for my own son, they had a virtual uh, graduation and his name scrolled up on a TV. So we had him in his cap and gown. We just had him walk across the front room and we videotaped it and we said his name and that was it. That was his graduation. And so, you know, and I've been talking with, you know, some people, it's like, it's, it's not about the parties. It's not about, but it's also, it's about shared experiences with their friends that this is something. So I think we, a lot of us can remember our high school. We might not remember everything. We don't remember the boring guy who spoke or the boring woman who spoke for, you know, hours about, you know, you're going to change the world kind of stuff. But you remember, you know, you remember throwing your cap up or you remember walking across the stage and yeah. getting that. Or you remember the guy who did some, had something stupid on their cap. You remember some of these things and some of those moments are gone. And when you've been working for something for 12 years to get to this point, to have it suddenly there's, it's, it's done. And, and for some kids, you know, for kids that are, might be going to college, you might get a sec, you'll get a graduation at that point. But for some kids that are like, this was it, this is all I got that, that ends. So, and it's tough because this is actually the transition from childhood to adulthood. At this point, you've, you know, kids are going to be 17, 18, you're officially an adult. And that's a transition that, you know, you, you have as a big mark and now, and, and now suddenly it's just gone. So I think we're seeing in a lot of kids, you know, and, and the thing is, I think it's also harder for us as adults because we build all this stuff up and, you know, we remember this. It's funny because a lot of the kids are kind of like, eh, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't know, is it, that, is it them trying to be tough or is it, you know, and, I, and it's also because they don't know what they're supposed to have. So that's good in one sense, but just that loss of that, but also, again, just that loss of that socialness, especially for those high school kids um, and for those preteens where they're developing those relationships, it's, it's so much. And just like Dr. Johnson was saying with the e-learning, with the e it's, it's, it's tough because they've, you know, it's like the longest senior ditch day ever. They've, they, on, and on March 14th, you know, that was your, you know, for some schools, that was your grade. And so for some kids, especially the seniors who are like, I got all A's, I'm in college, so yeah, I'm not showing up to that Zoom thing. You know, how is school going to start? And, you know, if for those kids that are going to be going back to school, what's it going to be like? How is it going to be? There's so, many, there's so many unknowns just in general in life, and now all of a sudden to have a huge unknown, you know, for the kids going to college. Will I go to college? Will I have a roommate? Will I be sitting in a dorm? Will I have to commute? Will it be online? There's so many different unknowns that, you know, like Dr. Johnson was saying, anxiety, if it wasn't already there, even the kids that weren't the anxious kids, 
you're seeing it. And, and that's, it's, it's kind of like the kids that aren't allergy kids, but like it's a huge pound thing. All of a sudden they're starting to get allergies. You're see, we're seeing kids that are just not, you know, we've always just kind of sailed through and all of a sudden we're like, Oh, that's a side. But again, some of it could also be, we as parents are putting our fears and our anxieties. Cause just like you said, yeah, Dr. Gomez, to when you're sitting there and you're looking 24 seven on, you know, pick whatever news channel you're looking in, it's coronavirus, coronavirus, you know, breaking news, breaking news, and everything's this. Or if you look on, you know, if you have a newspaper or every headline on every web page, you know, 60 more people dead, you know, more dead, more dead. It's, 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 it's kind of like, well, when's my turn coming? Am I, am I next? And there's so, and especially for the younger kids who might not get that, you know, your chances are low. If you keep hearing like, oh, all these old people are dying, old people are dying. Well, you know, what? grandma's old. Does that mean she's dying? And so there's so many, and so if there's so many different trajectories that this takes, it just makes it very difficult for kids. I know one of the challenges that I that I see, and certainly as a parent, you know, I want to make sure that we try to still instill some sense of regularity and schedule. And that's one of the things I've advised a lot of parents. So a lot of times when we talk about things that they can do right now, you can try to stick to a regular schedule. And the reality is that the statistics were that 55 million kindergarten through 12th graders were, um, were affected by school closures. And certainly now, of course, school is essentially over almost all across the country. So now we're in summer, but, but again, stick to a schedule. This is an opportunity for your child out there to continue to, to develop meaningful relationships. Now, I mean, what does meaningful mean when it's a 17 year old versus a five year old, but there's still time to nurture those human connections that are so important. You know, one of the things I fear about, I fear Dr. Johnson is those, those children that, have uh, that may come from a troubled situation where school was their their safe place where it got them away from a potentially dangerous or violent situation mm -hmm. and now they're back in that situation or that the sporting event was canceled the team sports that felt like their identity i need to play baseball or basketball and now i have to be at home in a situation talk a little bit about how some of the dysfunction some of the inequities that are out there uh, that you're seeing from kids that may have good support and kids that may be in a challenging situation. Mm -hmm. It's a real problem. And I wish I had a great sound bite to say like, no, it's all gonna be okay. It's not, you know, I think that's a, that's a very real issue as much as we've seen an uptick in domestic violence calls and things like that, you know, DCFS is busy too. And a lot of, a, a lot of the issues that are happening don't even, don't even see this, the statistics, right? They don't make it to being reported. Um, you know, for kid, a lot of kids, school is their, is their safe place. It's their place where they feel, um, welcome and held. It's the, it's the place where they get, you know, maybe their only meals of the day. Um, it's the place where, where somebody's finally paying attention to them or they're not constantly getting in trouble. And to have that end so quickly, um, I mean, to have it, to have it missing at all is a problem, but to have it end so quickly is is problematic in its own right, um, which unfortunately is what needed to be done, you know? And then the, the other half of that, right, is that now you've lost that respite, you've lost that same place, safe place rather, but like I said before, a lot of family time is a lot of family time and everybody's on edge, everybody's contained, they don't have the usual outlets that really becomes a crucible for the dysfunction in any family, right? Like even, you know, pretty functional families can have a lot of conflict. Like around here, we made sure everybody had their own space that we could all go to. And, you know, we managed to, to kind of get some distance from each other when we need it. And, and, you know, we're like here, we're, we're fine. We're doing great, but not everybody has that ability. Not everybody has that ability to plan ahead. Right. And to, and to create those safe spaces or is as mindful that needs to be happening and then certainly at the higher levels of dysfunction um where things get violent or things get frightening you know it's just a powder keg sometimes and so i think we all need to be a little bit <sighs> concerned about that we need i mean we need to be a lot concerned about that but we need to be a little bit more mindful of it and we need to be able to um maybe to reach out to kids friends or classmates that you know have a, a rough time or you know saying like what are we able to do? You know, while we're in phase three and phase four, we can probably do some at least socially distanced um, connection, right? So, you know, see if you can, you can at least make contact with those kids or, you know, give them some 
some outlet, some place to reach out to if they if they need to. I know it's not a bit. I know it's not obviously equal across the board, and uh, and we want to make sure that each child out there has opportunity. You mm-hmm. know, one of the things that I'm I still kind of wreck my brain because I do see some some older kids, 16, mm-hmm. 17, 18, is, is, a, is a talk about really how can we continue to nurture uh, those opportunities that are there? How do we see, you know, take the mindset of like, okay, if life throws you lemons, life throws you lemons, you make some lemonade, and it's not equitable across the board, but, but we're still trying to say you can still have meaningful connections even while we're mired in a pandemic. Of course, this pandemic has exposed so many faults. Mm-hmm. We've got this new consciousness of dysfunction in the healthcare yeah. system, and this con- some of this dysfunction was already there. It just wasn't we just weren't aware of it. Now things are exposed, and we have this collective consciousness. And I hope that this turns into an opportunity for us to take advantage and connect with people. I tell people if you still have a cause that you're passionate for, something that your kid does, continue to support that when you can. If your if your child loves to volunteer, you guys do meaningful impact that way. There are still ways to volunteer and teach your child about the global community, about other things that are bigger than what they are, what, than what you are even as a parent yourself. So there's opportunities out there. We just wish it was equitable, but, but it doesn't mean that we can't stop trying. Mm-hmm. Dr. Kovar, let me ask you this question. You know, uh, I think about some of the parents out there. How can parents know if they're, if they're, if they're looking at mental health and they're looking at saying like, okay, my child has, has stress and anxiety or they're having some troubles, where do you start that conversation? How do we let them know, number one, that you're open, you're open for business, Dr. Right. Johnson's open for, for business, therapists are open. How do we get that message out? Because some people may still have a fear of parents may have a fear of bringing their child to an right. actual facility. Of course. Well, then that's, then that's kind of the fear that's, that's out there. So I think the first thing as providers when we can keep doing is making sure we're engaged with our parents, be it, you know, on a Facebook or Twitter or our websites or however we do it, even just a mass text, hey, we're open. Um, and, you know, the thing that parents have to know also is that telehealth has become a kind of a godsend because there is that fear. And, you know, I don't want to go into your office, you know, the, the joke in, of course, in pediatrics is, oh, great, I'm going to come in here and then I'm going to get, you know, in about five days, my kid's going to come back sick. And, you know, now it's even heightened. So, you know, what we remind parents, especially for the well visits is, you know, we're not bringing a lot of the sick kids in. We're bringing, you know, a kid who, you know, skinned their knee. We're bringing, you know, a kid that's got an earache and that's it. But if they're coughing and fever, you're not coming into the office. So actually now's the best time to come to your doctor's office because, we're not doing all these things that are going to cause, you know, that, that are, that are higher risk. Um, so that's a very important thing, but also with telehealth, it's nice because the kids and the parents can be in their own home and we can connect them just kind of like we're doing now on zoom. Um, and it's always just, you know, doctors, we use a HIPAA compliant thing. So it's not like anyone can zoom in and, and, you know, whatever, whatever they are, hijack it. Um, it's HIPAA compliant, it's secure. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just the doctor and you. So you can talk about these things. And just to make sure that people know that we are open, we are available and talk to us because again, everyone thinks it's like, a, especially for kids, every kid thinks that they're always the only one going through X, Y, and Z. They're the only diabetic. They're the only kid with asthma. They're the only kid who's having some anxiety in their mind, even though they probably know it's not the truth. In a kid's mind, that's I'm the only one that is dealing with this. So um, for parents, if there's if concerns, then reach out to us because you know what, it's our job to say you know what this is concerning, and then we can have you talk to someone like Dr. Johnson, who's going to be better equipped to do this. But let's let's at least get the conversation started with us. Let's see what we can do. And also, first thing is making sure the kids aren't a harm to themselves because um, you know with anxiety, with the depression, with these unknowns. You know, there's there's going to be cases of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad story, but we had a kid that we uh, sent to the ER and just because on telemedicine, they were for some sick visit, they did not look great. Our nurse practitioner said, you know what, something doesn't look right, go to the ER. And, you know, everything was COVID focused. It actually was a suicide attempt. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you, there are things that happen. These are the things that we, you know, we as, as healthcare providers can't just get stuck in the blinders of everything is COVID. There are a myriad of other mental health uh, issues that are going to be going on. And unfortunately, you know, we don't want to miss those. You know, again, the rule in medicine is when you hear hoofbeats, you think it's going to be a horse, but every so often there's going to be the zebra. So right now the hoofbeat, it's a ton of COVID horses running through, but you know what, there's going to be some other, uh, you know, there's going to be the, the zebra or there's going to be a giraffe that comes through and they all have hoofs and it's going to sound the same. 
but we have to be aware of that. And so parents, we have to remember that, you know, we as healthcare providers, we are here for you and your children. We are always your child's advocate. And if there's something that's concerning you, get us involved so we can be concerned and we can get people like Dr. Johnson in so we can get the kids the help they need before it goes from, you know, a level one to a level 10. And now we're in a whole different realm, you know, and, and, and I think for kids, you know, the, the biggest thing parents need to tell them is that you can tell me anything and you're not, there's not going to be that judgment because there is that fear, especially, you know, some kids like I can't be, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say I'm depressed. I'm not going to say I'm this. I'm not this because it, it and, but it's all, that's just this, this, the stigma of mental health in general. I can never, you know, I'm a man, I can't say I'm this, or I'm, you know, my family has no history of depression, but it's like, you know, there's not, it's not a bad thing to admit. It, it's not a bad thing to admit you need help. And if you need help, let's get the people, if, if, if your house is on fire, I can throw water on my house, but let's get the people who know what they're doing to actually get it. So the house doesn't burn down, but you know, what little can, what little damage is done. We can hopefully we hopefully uh, fix that quickly. Excellent. Well, let's get to a section here. We're going to do a frequently asked questions and then go, those of you guys, again, you guys join us live here. We're breaking down COVID and kids and having some serious conversation, but I want to get an opportunity to get to some of your questions that are out there. So I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to do kind of like a FAQ frequently asked questions and we'll try to keep it quick. We'll kind of, I'm going to ask them to both, both my amazing colleagues and just see what their talk, thoughts are on some things. I got some that I prepared, but some that are coming through on the feed right now. And of course, you know, we're going to get into some this versus facts. Let's get a little FAQ. Here we go. Here's the question. Dr. Johnson, should my child participate in sports? I know I gave you such a broad question. Thank you. No, um, it's, uh, sports can be so many things, right? Um, anything that keep that gets them within, you know, six feet of each other right now is really not going to be a good idea. Um, they can probably go hit some golf balls, right? Like they can, they can do, you know, outdoor things where they can be six feet apart. Um, you know, I, a lot of like my, my stepdaughter's dance studio is doing, has been doing everything by zoom for a while. And that has been great for all of them. Um, it's actually been even a little bit better than usual because she also has like a Facebook or a Instagram live dance lesson every day from like the Prima Ballerina of the Metropolitan Ballet. Like, you know, there's some really, really fun kind of opportunities out there in that way. Um, but even, you know, like I said, the, the stuff that's in person, you still have to maintain that distance. You still have to um, be kind of mindful of, of what's going on. So yeah, we're probably not doing like a rugby scrum for a while. You know, it's and like, I want to pick up on that real quick. Yeah, if I ahead, may. Um, you know, the one thing that we also have to remember is, you know, Illinois, we've been pretty, our, our governor has been pretty, and, and, you know, Mayor Lightfoot has been very vocal about keeping the distance, but mm -hmm. other places, especially in those states around us may not have been. And so, um, you know, just because your child wants to do X, you know, oh, I'm going to go join a league in Wisconsin. We're going to just, we have a place up in Wisconsin. Now they're doing that. It's, it's not, again, it's just because you're up in Wisconsin doesn't mean it's, you're not going to catch it. So, you know, there are some teams, there are things, oh, we're just going to, you know, we're not going to do any tournaments in Illinois. So we're just going to have all of our baseball tournaments out in Kansas because they're, you know, and I don't know if Kansas is, but let's just pick out Kansas. Um, but if Kansas is not having the social distancing, that's great that you just did this. But the, the fact is at some point you're coming back to Illinois. And so now as the carriers, now you've reintroduced that stuff, which is, which is, you know, again, sports are important for, for kids. It's important for their identity, but if you can do some of those things, like, you know, if you're a baseball player, like even just if you have, there, there's a wall in a school that you can hit, you know, a tennis ball and you can just practice swinging and stuff like that. Do some of those things that you can, you can keep your skills up, but you know, it's, it's going to different States and going to different places where they're going to be a little bit lax. I, I, their issues can come along with that. Yeah, I agree. One of, one of the challenges that I see, and we'll get to the next question uh, for you, Dr. Cobra, in a second, is that, um, you know, sometimes some states are trying to have kids training cohorts, small cohorts that you're always right. going to train the same person. But the reality is that the, the big variable is that what happens when you leave that cohort, you can't guarantee the X factors, not the X factors it may be blind, that the kid may be going home to a house where everybody's in and out and all this kind of stuff. So we're trying to control, uh, 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 you know, something, but there's so many variables still at play. Um, at the end of the day, it's up to the parents that are going to make those decisions. Of course, you have to be comfortable. And I want parents out there to ask questions. If your child is, is set to return to a sport, 
ask a lot of questions about their safety. Of course, you have to also, if you do participate, you're also putting your faith in humanity. And we haven't lost our faith yet, but you're putting your faith into humanity that everybody's going to do their fair share. Here we go. Dr. Cobra, I like this question. Here it is. Um, I'm a parent with young children. We are all healthy and our risk is low. Why should my family have to worry about this virus when statistically we are not likely to need hospitalization, my child? Right. And I think it kind of goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. You're right. Your risk is low, especially for the younger children. But the problem is that kids aren't always going to show the signs and the things that we're thinking of. And we can be passing it on like a lot of viruses. We're passing it on before we know it. Because if the virus infected you and the minute it infected you, you felt horrible and you got a fever and you were you know, having all the symptoms that we know about, you're going to just by definition not go out. That's just kind of what we do. But the problem is with viruses, they're smarter than we are. They know, hey, I'm going to kind of get you infected, but I'm not going to make you feel bad for a few days so you can pass me on. And so then by the time you feel horrible, I've already been passed on, you know, one person passed it on to two, two to four, four to eight, and so on. And it just goes up exponential. Um, so yes, you might feel great, but the problem is you might go out to Target with someone who is also feeling great, but then, you know, they're going to go home and they're going to, they got to go to their, you know, to their parent who might have cancer or to, they're going to go home to, you know, and work in a nursing home and mm -hmm. pass it on there. And now we've got a, an epidemic going uh, in, in the nursing home. So again, just what we said, you kind of have to think a little bit more globally and yes, it's not fun to put on the mask. And I think so many people now have a, a respect for surgeons, what, you know, wearing the masks all the time um, that they're like, this is, I, I feel so, you know, wow, it's never knew it was this bad, but you know what? I'd rather have you be a little uncomfortable for a little bit and keep everyone safe than, you know, it, the risk is there and it's, it's, it's a too big of a risk. Gotcha. And the reality is too, Please. that, ahead, you know, from a statistical standpoint, your risk is probably low, but the risk is at zero, right? Like we've seen a lot of healthy kids get really sick. We've seen a lot of, you know, adults or, or young adults who haven't had really any risk factors be very, very sick, be on ventilators or even pass away. Um, so, you know, the, when, when, it, when you're talking about a big population, the risk might be kind of minimal, but if it's what happens to your family, that risk is everything, you know? So we can't, unfortunately, we don't have a good, you know, crystal ball to say, oh, you're going to just have mild symptoms and you're going to end up on a ventilator and you're not even going to know you have it. You just never know what's coming. Here we so. go, Dr. Johnson. I want to ask you this question. I want you to break out your magic eight ball. Here's the question. Oh, if uh, we were at my actual office, I actually have one of those. Oh, okay. I have, so. channel, channel I'll your, do the best I can. I want okay. you to channel your Miss Cleo right now. Um, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I'm going to channel mine as well, too. Here we go. Dr. Johnson, here's a question. Uh, when do you think COVID-19 will finally go away? I mean, I know people like to think psychiatrists are psychic. Um, but this really is just my best guess. <laughs> Truly, like, what I've seen from, you know, the, the, the modeling that I've looked at, what I've, what I've seen in terms of what the seasonal coronaviruses do, the ones we have kind of every year that don't put us all in the hospital. Um, I think we're going to be dealing with this for a couple of years at least, honestly. I think that the physical distancing measures, um, are going to be really helpful in containing it. But at, at the end of the day, vaccination is what's going to, going to make the difference. You know, maybe we can, we can find some sort of therapy for the cases, but that's going to take a while. And, you know, when we look at what it really takes to create a vaccine and get it tested and make sure it's safe and then manufacture it and get it to everybody. And yeah, we're going to be dealing with this for a hot minute. So um, this is unfortunately going to be our new normal for a while. And we really have to be creative about the ways that we settle into that. Thank you. Here you go, Dr. Cobra. Here's your, miss, here's your magic eight ball moment. Will schools, this is what people ask all the time, will schools reopen in the fall? Um, I think the easy answer is going to be yes, but it's going to be with the asterisk. There's going to be there's going to be masks, there's going to be social distancing. So, you know, everyone said, you know, what does that mean for a, you know, first grader, which, you know, there's going to be the, you know, put the mask back on your face. No, you can't use it as a weapon. No, you know, there's going to be all that kind of stuff. Um, I think there's going to be, it's going to be different in terms of social distancing, how they might have to do classes. There might be, um, uh, there's definitely going to have to be some changes that happen. And the big issue, obviously, for colleges, what's going to happen, because there's going to be some still, I think there's going to be some online stuff that will have to happen. Um, and it's just kind of part of the new normal until we can get things under control a little bit, because otherwise, 
you know, we're going to go back to phase one and nobody liked phase one. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of like, we have to say, we have to kind of be like the parent, like, don't make me turn this car around. But it's like, you know, listen, social distance, wash your hands, or I will put you back in quarantine and no one will go out. No one likes that, you know, and, and, uh, hopefully it will open, but there's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of little changes. And I think as long as people do that, we can be good. But again, it goes back to also being a, uh, a member of humanity. And if your kid's sick, you know, the, the rule was, ah, he's got a little low grade fever. I'm still going to send him we can't do that. You know, we, we shouldn't do it anyway, but now it's going to be even more because you know what, I know you need to get to work and we all need to get to work. We understand that, but you know, your little kids 100.4 temperature might actually be COVID and who then now gets, it goes to the school. Excellent. Here we go. Here's the next question. I like this one, Dr. Johnson, you're a big, you're a big fan of play and the psychology and the development in play. What we do is so here's the question. Can children who are social distancing have play dates? And does it matter if the play date is indoors or outdoors? Yes, asterisk to both to all of the whole thing. All that, fair um, again, as far as as far as I know, um, I think you you know this is a great time to get kind of creative with those play dates, right? Like, um, how you know can you do them virtually? Can you do them in person with you know with a, a, a sort of socially distanced thing? Um, there, there are some families who are, um, kind of choosing to make a quarantine bubble. Like we talked about before, there's a lot of variables and a lot of things to control for. Um, but I, you know, I've seen a couple of my folks do it successfully with like two families, right? So not, you know, this kid from here and that kid from there, but these two families are going to work together. Um, sometimes that can help with childcare and things like that. You have to be super careful about it, but you can kind of, you know, create those alliances, as it were, um, and kind of control those risks in a little, a little bit. Um, like I said, it's a great time to get, you know, creative with with what can we do with our friends that'll still let us be safe. Um, and tell me the second question because I've already lost. It. Uh, actually, you already, you already is it was whether or not indoors or outdoors. Oh yeah, I mean it. It does. It does make a difference. Um, outdoors is is probably preferable. Um, if, you know, you are going to allow people into your home, you have to be very, very careful. People should be wearing masks. Everything should be, you know, could, should still have that physical distance and you want to make sure you clean all of the surfaces <laughs> when they leave. But ideally outdoors is way better and a little bit more fun, honestly, like you could do a socially distanced walk together or a socially distanced bike ride or, you know, lots of, there's lots of fun things to do in the summer that you can still maintain your distance and still be safe. Just make sure yeah. you're not ignoring the other risks, like wear your bike helmet and make sure you're wearing sunscreen, you know. One Although, of the reality is that, uh, you know, we can still drive places and you'll see a big, a big pickup game of basketball someone today, a bunch of kids playing. So, you know, we can try to do as we can. We have to, you know, we're hoping that more people will do their fair share versus people that will not. We cannot get everybody to buy in. You just can't. That's impossible. But mm -hmm. humans need connection. We need longing. We need touch. So, so, but, but I think if more of us are doing these things, you know, here's a study. It was put out. It was by um, university. It was a collaboration between Georgia State University, University of Kentucky, University of Louisville. They put it out a few weeks ago, a group of economists, and they said, if we did not implement the, the shelter in place orders, then the order of magnitude that we would have seen this virus on would have been 35 times what yeah. we've seen it now. That is, that is lives at stake. That's living. That's millions and millions of more people. Uh, so, so again, the measures have worked. We just should not be get laying off now because we're seeing cases rise. Houston today, a group of nine mayors in actually Texas, not Houston, I'm sorry, San Antonio today reported 463 uh, new cases and actually 60% of the new cases were people between the age of 20 and 49. So you're seeing young people again doing things. Dr. Colbert, let me ask you this question and we'll get into some misfortunes facts. Right. Here's a statement that, that a lot of parents say. Many parents believe that the child's, that their child's immune system is now being set back if they are not out and about. Is this true or false? Uh, it's false. Kids actually, I mean, if you think about it, they have a pretty robust immune system. We as, a, we as humans have a very robust immune system. So are we being exposed to things? We're being exposed to things every day, whether we like to admit it or not. So our immune system doesn't kind of just go like, oh, I'm sitting inside my house. I'm going to go take a nap for a little bit. That's not how it works. So it's, it's ready to go. Um, and you know, it just by be socially distinct, you're not going to just turn your kid's social, uh, immune system off and then it'll, they'll get sicker because of it. Not at all. 
Thank you very much. So I want to get into the section. I love doing that. Some frequently asked questions. We got some more that I made into some Miss vs. Facts, but I want to keep this going. Every week on TRF with Dr. G, we do Miss vs. Facts, setting the record straight. We're going to do this. I'm, I might even participate. I'm feeling pretty good right now. Why not? Even though I'm going to make sure that they answer all the questions, uh, but I might get a little bit of it too. Why not? I uh, love these guys. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a statement. It's going to be myth or fact. And then I'm going to say it. My, my panelist is going to say myth or fact. And then they're going to tell us why. We're going to get through as many of these as possible. Here we go, Dr. Johnson. First question for you, or first statement. Therapy for kids is a waste of time, pandemic or not, myth or fact? Totally a myth. Please explain. That's, that's not even a myth. That's an outright lie. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I feel like everybody, even people that are, that are well-adjusted and doing well and feeling like things are good, everybody can benefit from a good therapy session or, or a good therapy relationship, right? We, we always can have new skills. We always can, can process our anxieties. And especially when we're talking about a time like this, where, you know, I know, I know we're, we're specifically talking about COVID, right? And all the things that go with COVID, but there, there are other upheavals going on right now and other scary things going on in the world. And I mean, I, I personally have had a much better time dealing with all of this because I've been able to process it with my therapist. And I know that, you know, all of the kids that I've talked to, once we've actually been able to kind of talk it out, that brings the anxiety down a little bit. So no, therapy is great. And here's the kicker. Um, this is probably the best time for therapy because it's going to be the most convenient because like my office has been virtual since the middle of March, right? We're doing teletherapy. This is what my patients see most of the time, right? Um, you know, having to get your kid to the therapist or whatever is, is not necessarily going to be as big an issue as it has been. So it's super convenient right now. A lot of people are doing remote work. Now is the time. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for stating that case. Here we go, Dr. Kovar. Here's a statement. It is unsafe for children to wear face masks. Myth, myth or fact? Uh, it's actually got a little bit of a truth to it, especially if you have any kind of a respiratory issue, if children have um, maybe a heart disease or something like that. But for the majority of kids over the age of two, you're going to be fine. Excellent. Here we go. I'm going to do this one because I said I was going to participate. Here's a statement. Encouraging your children to practice good hand hygiene will not make a difference. The answer is false. That is a myth. It will make a difference. Wash your hands 20 seconds. Encourage it all the time. And maybe give your kid a little bit of a smile and a, a smile or maybe a little toy if they do it. I'm just joking. Don't do this. Parents don't go crazy on that one. But it is a myth. You need to wash longer hand children of role play here we go dr johnson yeah. well hang on a second i just yeah. want to say we need to do that when covid's not a thing too oh yeah, yeah, yeah. wash That's your hands true. people yeah. wash, wash your hands, hands. okay go hashtag ahead. wash hands i know i love it yeah. here we go dr johnson here's a statement social yeah. distancing is not natural for children myth or fact i i think there's a little bit of truth and a little bit of of myth in that one um i think that you know it, something I read recently suggested that we need to replace um, the term social distancing with physical distancing Fair enough. Um, because we are social creatures and we absolutely do need together and need to be together rather and touch is very important. Absolutely. Um, but I think we can connect very easily in ways that do not require us to be physically um, that close to each other. And so, yes, it's totally normal and natural and, and appropriate for kids to like, want to run up and hug their grandma and want to tackle each other. And they don't, they don't necessarily understand it. Um, but with some guidance and, and creativity and all those things, they can do just fine with it. Here we go. Thank you. Dr. Justin. I like this one. Dr. Cobra, here's a statement. Uh, ultraviolet disinfection lamps kill coronavirus in children. Myth or fact? Uh, that's going to be a bit of a myth. Yeah. It's, it's, so, you know, ultraviolet, there's been a lot of, lot of uh, talk about that. Um, and, you know, Putting it on, putting your phone under an ultraviolet light, who cares? Putting your money and all that stuff that is going to be in circulation, you know, people should disinfect your phone. They say it's one of the dirtiest things. But putting your child under an ultraviolet light, no one knows what it's going to do. And you don't want to find out that, you know, 10 years later, like all that ultraviolet light for 20 minutes gave them skin cancer. Absolutely. Here we go. Thank you for clearing that. Here we go, Dr. Johnson. I like this one. Um, with our fact, spraying alcohol or chlorine over my child's body can kill coronavirus. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. I don't care what anybody tells you. The ble bleach is, bleaching your child is not a good idea. Um, the, the part where that is actually true, though, is that, you know, you do want to make sure your, um, 
your disinfectants have a high enough alcohol content, your, you know, specifically your hand sanitizers and things like that. You want them to be over 70% alcohol um, to make sure they do kill, you know, enough of the viruses that we need them to. Um, but I, but I would limit your um, covering your children with isopropyl or ethyl alcohol to just their hands from the little squirt of hand sanitizer. Please don't like give them a Purell shower or spray them with bleach. There we go. I got you. Here we go. Dr. Kobar, myth or fact. Here's a statement. Swimming in a public pool carries no risk for transmission of the novel coronavirus. Myth or fact. Uh, If anyone's ever been to a public pool, I think there's a lot of risks of everything. So, um, you know, and also we know that, you know, if you're swimming in a a public pool, uh, you know, kids are going to get up, you're going to swallow a little bit of water, you're going to cough it up, stuff like that. So now we've aerosolized things. Um, Kids also, let's face it, once you're in a pool, every kid, what do they do? They go meet someone else and they try to dunk them underwater. So you're going to get that. You're going to get more coughing. You're going to get more aerosolization. So no, it's not the safest place to be right now. All right, here we go. There was a recent, uh, there was a recent statement from, I think it was the CDC saying, oh, you can't catch COVID from pool water. Um, so a lot of people have taken that as a green light to go have things like pool parties. Um, but like you said, Dr. Kovar, it's not, it's, it's not necessarily, like, you can't necessarily catch it from pool water, right? Like, so if someone goes in the pool and they get out and then you get in the pool, like, that's that's what the CDC is talking about. But if you're right. in the pool with anybody, you're at as much risk as, as, much, as if you're standing next to them and probably more, right? Because you're coughing and sputtering and doing all those things. Absolutely. Look at the Lake of the Ozarks. I mean, the outbreak was in, right. got exactly. the outbreak there. So no. aerosolization and there for that time. Here we go. A couple more of these. I'll take this one. I read that garlic is a healthy food and may have some antimicrobial properties. Therefore, my child can just eat a lot of garlic to help prevent coronavirus infection. That is a myth. That's a little bit under the, under the maybe more of an anecdotal thing that garlic does help out fortify the immune system. But here's what I say for immune system. Exercise, eat healthy, sleep, stress management, don't smoke cigarettes, don't drink alcohol, and nurture the mind-body relationships. Here we go. I like this one. Dr. Kovar, temperature scanners, here's the statement, temperature scanners can be used to detect infants and children infected with coronavirus. Myth or fact? Uh, that is definitely a myth. Uh, a temperature time. scanners detect temperature. That's it. And, uh, there's not, it's not a special <laughs> space I like, age I like thing. Your, I, like your, I like your answer, though. It detects that's, yeah. temperature. <laughs> so, and it's, that's, that's pretty much it. They're a thermal meter. So, um, you know, the, the thing is that people are like, oh, my kid doesn't have a temperature or they do have a temperature. Just having a temperature doesn't mean your kid's got corona. You could have an ear infection. They could have teething. There's so many things that can cause a little, they could be, especially for infants, they could be wrapped overly tight in a warm house because it's the summer. You went out for a walk. So that doesn't necessarily mean, does not necessarily mean corona. All right, here we go. That's Miss versus Pax, everybody. I love it. So we got about five minutes left. So what I want to do is, is, is wrap this up, but this has been such a, just a engaging conversation. And let it be known that this should not be the only time we talk about COVID and kids. I encourage you again to, to talk with your family, talk with your loved ones, parents, if you have questions, ask your doctor or you have children, just talk, but don't let this conversation stop. So I want to start with Dr. Kovar. Give us a few tips out there, things that parents, grandparents, coaches, mentors, caregivers of all walks that are caring for the lives of children that we love and protect, what should they take away from what we're talking about? Talk about the importance of COVID in kids and why would you keep this conversation going? Well, you definitely, exactly. Thanks so much for having me. I think you definitely want to keep this going. The biggest thing to remember, I think Dr. Uh, Johnson had said it early on, low risk is not zero risk. So just because your kid's chances of having a bad thing, uh, having a bad outcome with COVID are not 30%, 40%, 30%, 40%, it's not zero. So do you want to take that risk? I always tell kids, and we talked about this on our on the uh, show with vaccines, if there was a gun that had 100,000 chambers and you could put one bullet in it and spin it, are you going to put it to your child and, sh- and pull the trigger? The answer is no. The risk is low, but are you going to take that risk? So this is the same kind of thing. Are you going to take that risk with your child? And I think a lot of people would say no. Um, big other big thing, of course, you kind of like you spoke before, good hand hygiene. That's the most important thing. Don't touch your face. Don't touch other people's faces. Wash your hands 20 seconds. You know, think of new songs that you can sing as what, happy birthday twice. Um, but think of other songs that you can sing that, you know, for 20 seconds. Sing, you know, sing as a parent, sing a song that you know is going to make your kids upset because you keep singing it wrong or, you know, you know, you're trying to be all cool and they're like, oh, that's not, you, you've made that song uncool. But just, you know, just every, we should all have something that we can, you know, have something that's fun, 20 seconds. And then the biggest thing I think for parents and for any mentor, uh, you know, again, be it a parent, a grandparent, uh, a sports uh, trainer, is, is listen to the kids. 
And, and we have to remember, like a lot of things, just listen, keep your ears open. Kids are going to tell you things. They might not tell you directly because they might not have the words, or the way to express it, but listen to them and listen to their fears and be able to at least take it in and then figure out, you know, and then call us, call a health professional, call, call someone that can help you, can help guide you to what we need to do to keep your kids healthy and safe during this time and keep you healthy and safe. So that's the biggest thing. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Kobar. Dr. Johnson, give us a few take-home points to be successful and continue this conversation going when it comes to COVID and kids. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is so important that we're talking about this. And, and I definitely second, you know, we need to listen to our kids and kind of meet them where they are. Um, I, you know, one thing I would definitely say is reiterate to them it's okay to be scared right? Like it's okay to, to feel nervous. It's okay to, to worry. It's okay. It's okay um, to have all those emotions and it's okay to kind of empathize with them on that. Right. And, and, you know, and to say like, yeah, I'm, I'm scared too. Actually, this, this worries me too. Um, and so how are we going to, how are we going to feel better? How are we going to feel safer? How are we going to, you know, learn to manage and regulate ourselves? Right. Um, the caveat to that being, you know, this is, as, as an adult who kind of knows all of the possibilities and, you know, particularly for those of us, you know, in healthcare, right. Who can, who can just go astronomically, you know, just spiral with all of the possibilities of how this can, can happen and all the terrible things that can happen. Right. Like, you know, for, I know a lot of parents out there are, are doing that. Um, and to that, I would say really be careful about your own mental health too, and make sure that is also a priority because your kids are going to pick up on that and your kids are going to reflect that. And you need to be your best self right now too, to be available to them. So um, please don't hesitate to get them some, someone to talk to or someone to, um, to work with, but please also mind your own mental health and, and look for somebody if you need that too. Cause right now is a, it is a very, very easy time to be sucked into that like anxiety spiral. And, you know, it is, it is definitely okay to be worried. It is definitely okay to be anxious, but we're going to, we're in a marathon right now. And we're, you know, we're, we got to all get through this together. And it's important for us to model that for our kids. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. And my final thoughts for this, I'm going to kind of break it down for those out there with older kids and those out there with younger kids, younger kids. For older kids, you know, have those meaningful conversations. It's okay to get deep. They have to know what's going on, especially those that have just graduated they are now adults or they're about to graduate. Their lives have been changed, but it's your job as a parent, a caregiver, a loved one to go ahead and have these conversations and to do them without judgment and without any fear. But even if there is some fear about the realities of COVID-19 and some of their uncertainties, it's okay to acknowledge that anxiety. It's okay to just, to just uh, open yourself up and know that 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 a conversation should be heard in return and recognized in return. Again, we're in this together as a family. We want to make sure you're out there and have all the tools you need for success. For parents and grandparents of younger kids, I'd say this, you know, I'm going to give you five tips. Number one, make sure your child washes their hands, wash hands for at least 20 seconds as much as possible. That's one of your best ways to stop the spread of the virus and kill germs on surface. Number two, it's okay to continue to visit friends but consider continuing to do so from a virtual standpoint. Again, we can have virtual relationships that can be just as meaningful as physical relationships. Number three, masks, 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 masks are safe. They're not scary. Encourage your kid to wear their mask if they had to go outside, but again, they're safe, not scary. Number four, cover your cough or sneeze. Need enough said on that one. The best way to minimize germ spreading. And number five, tell your little ones out there to be good helpers. I tell it to my kids all the time. You can tell it to yours. As more, the more they're involved in this process, the more they'll understand. It's also an opportunity for you guys to continue to build and nurture relationships as parents, caregivers, grandparents, and other loved ones. Remember, COVID-19 has had and will continue to have major health and well-being implications for our children for the time to be but it's always important to continue to talk about them. So thank you, everybody out there. I want to thank my guests, Dr. Kate Johnson, Assistant Professor, Board Certified Adult and Child and Adolescent Psychiatrist, Loyola University Medical Center. Check her out. My good friend, Dr. Stephen Kovar, Board Certified Pediatrician, Kids First Pediatrician. 
Pediatrics LTD. He's also chair of the Department of Pediatrics at Edward Hospital. You've been listening and watching live on Facebook. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, uh, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producer is Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Music is by the wonderful Mr. Havis. Copyright 2020 by MDG Wellness, LLC. Stay tuned for my next episode next week, The COVID Effect on Sports. Dr. Kovar, Dr. Johnson, it's always my pleasure. Thank you. Have a great night. Take care, everybody. Peace.